Episode 1. The Premise. Act 1. Do you want to live? We make no illusions about the fact that we want to live. In fact, endless hours of our day are dedicated to keeping ourselves alive. We look left and right when we cross the street, to the extent that we even do it on a street that is visibly and audibly empty. We consume countless hours of content showing us a healthy diet, exercise and lifestyle, a non-eternal loop of life-extending advice, ironically taking away more time from living than we care to picture. If I had a euro for each time someone gave me tips on living a healthier life, I'd have a bitcoin by now. In 2008, the movie The Happening, starring Mark Wahlberg, tells the story of a toxin that affects the human brain and deprives people of their will to live. One courageous scientist, the said Mark Wahlberg, embarks on the adventure of saving his family and the entire world in the process. Which is all pretty impressive, given that Mark Wahlberg also had to find the Boston Marathon bomber in Patriot's Day or happened to be on the Deepwater Horizon oil drilling platform when it exploded. If Mark Wahlberg is on your train, it might be time to get off. That is, if you care to keep living, but I digress. The happening has this poorly scripted scene towards its crescendo. The groups of survivors have just split up, and one of them has just been hit by the wave of the mind-altering toxin while out of the sight of the other group. When it loses its will to live, all we see is a hill, and all we can hear is the shots emanating from their firearms committing suicide. The toxin is affecting them? Are those people killing themselves? You were with a private. What do we do? We need to do something. Hey, just let me think. Ah, they're dying. I need a second. They released it? We're not near the road. We can't just stand here as uninvolved observers. I need a second, okay? Just give me a second. We're not going to be one of those assholes on the news who watches a crime happen and not do something. We're not assholes. Just a second. There were children in that room. Elliot, please tell us what to do. I need a second, okay? Why can't anybody give me a goddamn second? This scene is far from being M. Night Shyamalan's greatest cinematic achievement. But other than that, can we stand being the assholes on the news who watch the crime happen and not do something? What if the crime is what people are doing to themselves? Don't expect me to give you all the answers. All I have is a couple of hours of your time on this podcast series, which, by the way, do recommend to a friend if you think it will interest them, to tell you about a movement of people who does not want to idly stand by while people harm themselves. Unlike The Happening, this is not about a toxin affecting their brain inadvertently, but about vices, or sins, we will use different words to describe them, and those who seek to root them out. Alcohol, nicotine, sugary drinks and gambling, you know, all the bad stuff. All the stuff that your parents warned you about, even as they were sometimes doing it themselves. All the stuff that is legal, yet also dangerous. For the next five episodes, what I'll do is lead you through the perpetrators of neo-prohibitionism, which is technically a good term to describe them, but it doesn't really work for a podcast title. Also, I keep spelling it wrong. I'm serious. Try typing it on your phone. It's really not easy. So instead, for the sake of this podcast, they're the fun police. Moms Against Vaping, Alcohol Policy Alliance, the National Coalition Against Legalized Gambling, there's many. In fact, the names of these organizations are so repetitive that in an earlier version of this script, I accidentally inverted the name Moms Against Vaping and said Moms Against Gambling. Turns out Moms Against Gambling also exists. In fact, moms are against a lot of things. Moms Against Video Games, Moms Against Drunk Driving, the famous one for which the acronym is MAD. There's even Moms Against Murderers Association, not related to paternalism. Trust me, I do think murder should be very much illegal. The reasons moms oppose a lot of the vices, such as vaping, is because they're justifiably worried about children. And I want to say this from the get-go. Children should not have access to gambling, cigarettes, vapes, alcohol, or any other drugs. There's a legal responsibility to make sure that is enforced. Businesses who sell to minors should lose their license. People who facilitate these products and services to children should be punished. And there's both a parental and collective responsibility to prevent children from accessing them. But when these groups argue for regulation in the name of children, the rules they suggest do not just affect children, but all consumers who buy them. It creates a circular argument that inevitably brings us back to square one 
A bit like in the Simpsons clip. I predict this is the last we'll be hearing about prohibition. We want prohibition! We want prohibition! You can't seriously want to ban alcohol. It tastes great, makes women appear more attractive, and makes a person virtually invulnerable to criticism. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? What kind of an example are we setting? Ladies, please. All our founding fathers, astronauts, and World Series heroes have been either drunk or on cocaine. Let's take children out of the argument for all the subsequent arguments and talk about harm. In liberal societies, the way our rights work is predicated on a mishmash of philosophical concepts, one of which is the harm principle by a 19th century English philosopher named John Stuart Mill. And it goes a bit like this. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others, or expressed differently, your right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. This is a pretty common understanding of rights today, but it didn't used to be quite this simple when John Stuart Mill was around. There was a time when your rights weren't inalienable. They would stand and fall with the ruler, often a king or a queen in swanky clothes, or they were just up to the interpretation of whoever was enforcing the law to you. Even at the start of the 20th century, women in America could get arrested for smoking cigarettes, because the association was that if you're a woman smoking, you must be a prostitute. But okay, we've come a long way from that. Pending improvements to the criminal justice system, it is generally accepted that you should only be coerced by the state if you yourself brought harm onto others. But what about the harm you do to yourself? Smoking is clearly bad for you. It can cause emphysema and lung cancer. Gambling can cause addiction and ruin you financially. Millions of people are hurt by alcohol addiction or accidents caused by impaired vision or judgment. Did John Stuart Mill think about self-harm at all? As long as you're given the information and you process the information, uh, you have consented to you know, what can happen within the rules of the boxing match. Uh, and I think even there's this, this interesting question, too, uh, about then, then what counts as a harm. Christopher Freiman is an associate professor of philosophy at the College of William and Mary. He's also published two books, Unequivocal Justice and Why It's Okay to Ignore Politics. He's a graduate of Duke University, BA in philosophy, and the University of Arizona, where he has a master's degree and PhD in philosophy. Arguably, having this conversation from the start meant that we needed a philosopher. Because more than a question of policy and politics, the essence of prohibitionism is that of philosophy. What is the philosophical implication of harm? How should we think about it in a productive way? So the basic idea is that the, the state is only justified in restricting your freedom in those cases where you might harm other people. And so this gets complicated. So there are these questions about what exactly counts as a harm. Uh, are, there, are, are there some cases of harm that seem permissible? So, for example, if I, if I set up a business and I acquire a lot of customers and it puts you out of business, is that harm up, you know? So that, so setting that, that kind of complication aside, uh, the short version might be something like, as long as you are not harming another person in their person or property, uh, you should be allowed to do it. And so one implication of this is you should be permitted to do things which might be harmful to yourself. So for example, uh, you, sh- you know, uh, should be permitted to eat too much sugar drink too much alcohol, assuming you're not drunk driving, and so on. And so uh, it, it, it has anti-paternalistic implications. And we'll get into some of that. Was that a novelty idea um, when John Stuart Mill um, explained it for the first time? So I think this idea that, you know, you should be the author of your own life, that sort of thing was uh, an idea that, that people uh, upheld at that time. But I think Mill really gets credit for making it very explicit and providing a very detailed and extensive defense of this idea. That, that you know, as long as uh, what you are doing affects you and you alone, you have the right to do it. So let's talk about consensual harms. So uh, one of the examples that, that pops up that we can think about is a boxing match. So if I participate in the boxing match and I get my nose broken, the, I didn't go in with the intention of getting my nose broken, uh, even right. though that is a possible byproduct. Can I say that I consented to the harm or the potential of the harm by it going into the boxing match? Yeah, so I would say as long as, as you've been given adequate information ahead of time, 
uh, and you understand the relevant sort of information and the relevant sort of risks. And I suppose this is something we could talk about later, whether merely being provided with the information is enough. Uh, do we maybe have to process it in an unbiased way, that, that sort of thing. But, but setting that complication aside for the moment, I think you'd say, yeah, as long as you're given the information and you process the information, uh, you, you have consented to you know, what can happen within the rules of the boxing match. Uh, and I think even there's this, this interesting question, too, uh, about then, then what counts as a harm. So if you say, look, you know, I consent to this boxing match, to participate in this boxing match. And, you know, I guess depending on the match, maybe, maybe you do it in exchange for a couple million dollars. Like, OK, that's not a you could say, like, all things considered, uh, the, the boxing match is a benefit to you. Uh, and the idea is that that's the reason why you consented to it in the first place. Because he said, yeah, okay, there is the, this risk of bodily injury. I'm taking that into account, but uh, I value the $2 million, you know, whatever it is, more than uh, the risk of, of the harm. And so I think there, there's a plausible account of that where it's, it ceases to be a harm. So the punch itself is still a harm. Like it still hurts you. That's a harm. But all things considered, the boxing match and the money you get from it uh, could be a benefit. Couldn't we make the argument that this should be prevented because it isn't necessary. Uh, you could say that if you work security for a club and there will, a fight will break out, as the security guard, there was, there's a necessity for that type of activity because security yeah. is necessary for the establishment. But the boxing match has no utility other than entertainment. So what would you tell someone who would say, I mean, we should prevent people from uh, beating themselves for no reason other than entertainment? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think there's value in entertainment, uh, so I don't think that's nothing. But also, I think that, you know, there is this question. So you say, well, it's not necessary. And then my follow-up question is, well, not necessary, uh, you know, by whose lights? And so you might say, look, the, the person who gets to make that call is the boxer. So the boxer might say, look, you know, I can understand why people who aren't boxing fans don't see the value in this. Uh, but of course, there are boxing fans who see value in it. Nevertheless, I'm the one who gets to make the call. I'm the one who gets to determine whether the reward is worth the risk in this case. You don't have to agree with me. You get to make that call. I don't get to make that call. Here appears to be the crux of the issue, where we draw the line between public health and private decisions is ultimately where prohibitionists and laissez-faire proponents disagree. So I found this paper online. It's called Reformulating Milne's harm principle. Uh, it's in the Oxford Academic Journal called Mind, and this is by Ben Saunders, who is an associate professor in political philosophy at the University of Southampton in the UK. And he has a passage in this paper, and I'll read it to you and get your take on it. It does not matter whether an individual harms herself or others, provided that all who are harmed consent to the harm. Consensual harm is never grounds for intervention, while intervention to prevent self-harm can be justified where that harm is non-consensual. Ordinarily, self-regarding actions will be protected because people generally consent to any harm that they knowingly do to themselves. What do you think? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'd be interested to hear, right, in these cases of uh, self-harm that are non-consensual. Uh, so presumably these are sorts of cases where the, the person undertakes the activity without an adequate understanding of, of what the risk is. Uh, and so perhaps in that case, prevention is justified. And Mill actually had, so this is like a, a very famous case for Mill, which I think is fascinating. So Mill is generally an anti-paternalist. So he says, you know, look, as long as your, uh, your action only affects yourself, uh, you should be allowed to do it. But he actually says there, there's an exception to this sort of rule. And uh, he gives us this really fascinating thought experiment uh, to illustrate the point. He says, imagine... Uh, that uh, you see a pedestrian about to cross a bridge and you happen to know that the bridge is on the verge of collapse. So if this pedestrian walks across the bridge, the bridge will collapse and let's say they'll die. And you know that they don't wanna die. The only reason why they're walking across the bridge is because they don't know that the bridge is on the verge of collapse. And suppose also for one reason or another, you can't persuade them to stop. So maybe they don't believe you. Maybe they think, oh, you're just joking. Or maybe they speak a different language and so you can't communicate with them. So the only way you can stop them from walking across the bridge and falling to their death is by stopping them. 
No, it says in that case, you're actually justified in stopping them. Because in that instance, you're actually preventing them from doing something that, that they don't really want to do. They don't really want to cross the bridge. If they knew what the cost, if they knew what the effect of crossing the bridge was going to be, they wouldn't do it. So you're actually helping them advance their own end in that case. So for Mill, that was an interesting exception to, to some of this. And so I presume this is uh, um, a case of uh, self-harm that doesn't count as consensual. But then there, there are the, these other cases where people are adequately informed of the risks. And there we say, we generally let people take those risks. So I think, you know, interesting cases of this concern, uh, things like surgery. So we generally allow people to undergo surgery, even if it's very risky, uh, as long as they, they give their informed consent. And we might say from the outside, look, I don't, I don't think this risk is worth it. Like if it were up to me, if it were me, I wouldn't undergo the surgery. Somebody can go, fair enough, point taken, uh, but it's not you, it's me. And I know the risks, I know the rewards, and I'm going to agree to it. And so in that case, it seems like we really should not interfere with that person's free choice. Well, so that's, that, that brings me then to the vices, let's call them that for lack of a better term, um, drinking alcohol, we could say drinking alcohol excessively maybe, um, smoking cigarettes, gambling, uh, all those things that are risky and that a lot of people like to engage in. What do we do with those? I mean, you gave the example of someone crossing a bridge not knowing that the bridge is about to collapse. There are people who know that you know, smoking is not good for them, but they might not maybe understand the entire extent of it or because they haven't shown enough interest. Would I be justified to go and slap the cigarette out of their hands? So I think there are different sorts of cases here. So he, here's one case, and I think this is not the kind of case that you have in mind, but it, it's probably worth putting on the table. So one case is you have somebody who, let's say, is interested in gambling. And let's say they genuinely understand the risks, and they think about the risks, and they say, I want to bet anyway. That's one sort of instance. And then you could have a paternalistic argument that says, I understand that you understand the risks, and that you're thinking clearly, and that you want to take the risks. But gambling is like objectively bad, or it's objectively vicious, or something like that. And so I am going to impose my view of what is good on you and prevent you from gambling. It's not that you're making any sort of mistake about what the risks are. You're making like a moral mistake about what's, what's good in life. That's one kind of paternalism. I don't think that's justified. Uh, so in that case, really, it does seem like uh, you're, you're imposing uh, a conception of a good, a conception of the good on people who don't endorse it. I think another case, which is, which is a little trickier and more interesting and closer to the bridge case, is the person who doesn't really understand the risks of gambling. And so we say something like, if you really understood the risks, you wouldn't do it. Or another case of this is something like seatbelt mandates. So should we force people to, to wear a seatbelt? Should we force adults to wear a seatbelt? Uh, and you might say, well, look, as long as they have adequate information, like, you know, uh, you're at higher risk of injury in an accident if you're not wearing a seatbelt. And the person says, yeah, no, I know. I still want to ride unbelted. Um, then should we, you know, should we nevertheless force the seatbelt on them? Or should we say, well, no, you get to do whatever, whatever you want? Well, I think that's kind of a trickier case. Uh, because it's one thing to see on paper, yeah, no, I know my risk of injury is higher uh, if, I, if I'm if i riding unbelted. But it's another thing to actually sort of absorb that information in the right way. Uh, and, and I think an obstacle here is bias. And so a lot of new paternalists uh, worry a lot about bias. So the idea is something like this. You say, okay, I get the, I get the, the sheet that tells me all the risks of riding unbelted. And I say, yeah, no, I get that, but here's the thing. I'm actually a great driver. I'm, you know, one of the best drivers in the world. And so, yeah, yeah, no, I know I've got all this information, but it doesn't really apply to me because I'm an exceptionally good driver. But then, of course, I, I'm, I, this number is not exactly accurate, but it's not, actually not far off. It's like 90% of drivers think that they're above average drivers. <laughs> so, okay, maybe you're, not thinking, maybe you're not thinking super rationally here. Oh, no, I'm the exception to the, to the rule here. And so this presents an interesting case. 
where you have the information, but for one reason or another, you don't process it rationally. Recycling old adages. There's this quote, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. It's supposed to tell us that nothing that happens is original, often referring to politics or political-esque events. The quote is attributed to Mark Twain, but there's no proof he actually said it. The great stroke of irony being that there are many similar quotes associated with other personalities. They are all similar, even if they don't, well, rhyme. There's something true to the idea that we're not reinventing the wheel here. Prohibition is not a new concept. It, in fact, predates the modern conversation by well over 100 years. Quote, between 1890 and 1930, 15 states enacted laws to ban the sale, manufacture, possession or use of cigarettes. And no fewer than 22 other states and territories considered such legislation. End of quote. Historian Cassandra Tate notes in her 1999 book Cigarette Wars. Quote, by 1920, minors could legally buy cigarettes only in Virginia and Rhode Island. Many municipalities imposed further restrictions, from making it illegal for women to smoke in public, to outlawing smoking in or around school buildings, to banning certain kinds of advertising. Cigarette smokers faced discrimination in the courtroom, in the workplace, and in daily life. In 1904, for example, a New York judge ordered a woman to jail for 30 days for smoking in front of her children. End of quote. The temperance movement was a phenomenon of its time not merely for idealistic views, but also for the practical implications of political goals. The campaigning anti-alcohol activists published pamphlets and advertising in newspapers attempting to scare people away from the idea of drinking for good reasons. Here's an old NBC report. You know, you start out just tippling slightly, occasionally a drink with dinner, eventually affects your work, you eventually start beating your wife, you know, mistreating your children... Uh, You lose your job, you become unemployed, and you eventually end up being a derelict on the street and you die. That's sort of the general arc. It's basically a standard morality story that was presented and published and distributed quite widely in the United States. Alcohol in the 19th century is rampant. Certainly in cities, saloons are all over the place. The temperance movement is certainly concerned about alcohol abuse the ramifications of uh, the abuse of liquor on the family, on work, and so on and so forth. But it's also concerned about alcohol because of a change in the notion of appropriate behavior in public, public drunkenness, which was quite common in the 18th century, now becomes outlawed in the 19th century. And it's also a concern because of issues of industrialization, wanting people to appear on time every day and work uh, in that that period of time, sometimes 12 hours a day, and work at least six days a week. Finally, another concern about the temperance movement is politics. And bars, particularly once the immigrants entered the major American cities, became focal points for political organizations. So some of temperance reform was about taking away control from immigrants. Irish and German immigrants came with the tradition of of alcohol consumption as part of their social life, part of their ways of celebrating, part of their diet in many cases. And they come at the same time where America is enthusiastically embracing the temperance movement. In an article for Reason in 2014, Jacob Greer writes, quote, as with alcohol, these prohibitions did not last. Lacking the will for consistent enforcement, governments applied the laws rarely and selectively. The rising tide of cigarettes, driven largely by soldiers returning from World War I and the association of smoking with women's independence, proved impossible to stem. By the end of the 1920s, states generally had decided it was easier to tax and regulate cigarettes than to ban them. End of quote. That's the interesting thing. It is actually a phenomenon that could happen in any single country because, as it turns out, even in our study, Uh, We looked at two very different countries with two very different institutional backgrounds and histories, uh, Russia and the United States. You you can say that Russia definitely doesn't enjoy the rule of law or limits to political engagement that the United States does. 
but nevertheless, there was a uh, there was prohibitionism in both. This is Emil Panjao. He's the research manager at Consumer Choice Center, a colleague of mine, and a human Wikipedia. Do you know how there's two types of people? One being the one that will launch into a board game with a mere surface level knowledge of the rules, and then the one who can only partake once he understood every aspect of the game, its rules and exceptions, how the special cards play into it, and how they modified the rules after an incident at the 1998 International Board Game Convention. Yeah, Emil is the latter type. We wrote a paper together about all this. You can find it online by going on consumerchoicecenter.org. We look at the history and the current expression of prohibitionism and what drives it. But back to the question on the novelty of prohibitionism. Uh, There is, in fact, a very long history stretching back in some countries to literally the 17th century, looking at these uh, these public uh, public policy instruments in place to prohibit certain social activities in the name of public harmony, public health, or some notion of religious good in certain, uh, especially in in older cases of prohibitionism. I mean, really, in the United States, we can talk about the beginning of it with the clean living movement in the 19th century, uh, when a variety of actors insisted that activities such as uh, drinking, smoking, consumption of narcotics, and even masturbation, believe it or not, were, were harmful to yourself as a person and you needed to be prevented from doing these things for your greater good. Later on, this there was an added impetus involving more bureaucratic structures in the progressive area when th- people really remember prohibition as being a thing, uh, stretching to the 1920s and 1930s. But I would argue, and our paper argues, that actually prohibition continues to this day uh, in the United States. So it's not even just a historical phenomenon, it's an ongoing phenomenon. It's it's an appealing idea, and it's been rooted in different types of um, argumentation, that, uh, the arguments from morality, um, the practicality of it, you know, the protecting protecting public health. Um, it has an aspect of religion. We talked uh, about this with with uh, Chris Snowden on the podcast as well. There's so many different uh, aspects to it, um, and it begs the question. Whether it is area specific, is it that um, richer countries are more prone to it than poorer countries? Is the West more prone to it than the East? Is this is this a phenomenon that you know existed specifically in the United States because they had prohibition of alcohol? Um, is it is it a global phenomenon? What what is prohibitionism geographic? That's the interesting thing. It, it is actually a phenomenon that could happen in any single country because as it turns out even in our study uh, we looked at two very different countries with two very different institutional backgrounds and histories uh, Russia and the United States you you can say that Russia definitely doesn't enjoy the rule of law or limits to political engagement that the United States does but nevertheless there was a uh, there was prohibitionism in both countries going to the present with surprisingly similar policies and attitudes because, uh, in fact, as we kind of hypothesize and show in our text, prohibition is really more like a culture. It's a set of assumptions that influence the way institutions work. So if it's like the chicken and the egg question, then this is definitely the egg that came first and culture came first in these instances. And which is why you find prohibition in many different countries and many different points in history within within these different countries. We haven't looked specifically at the entire world, uh, but seeing these two very different countries engaged th- this way is pretty strong evidence for the claim that it actually is something that you find around the world. And we know examples from around the world, like uh, uh, the, the recent rules in Brunei or uh, in Myanmar on, uh, on smoking and so on. Would you say, after having sifted through so much of the prohibitionist arguments, that prohibitionists always mean well? For the sake of, um, uh, l- let's say, when you engage academically, you first assume charitable assumptions because you want people to, you you want to take the most well-meaning, plausible explanations first. 
but even in that context, the actual consequences of what you will do, even if you're well-intentioned, can be very bad. It's uh, We don't have to assume Thomas Aquinas and Catholicism to think that well intentions, good intentions lead to good results. Well, in the real world, that doesn't really work out that way. So even people who are well-intentioned within prohibition movements can act as an, at an institutional level in such a way to bring about really bad and corrupt outcomes. And we can see that. Uh, even in our study, where people who insisted on the morality of of banning these uh, different lifestyles actually ended up creating a very um, corrupt system that didn't end up removing anything, but it did end up making lives worse. But, you know, it, beyond charity, it's certainly true that people engage for a variety of reasons, and even people... Um, even the same people can engage for different reasons. It's not like one person has only one reason for engaging in the world. Some people might have reputations at stake related to specific policies. They might have, well, as Niskanen would put it, they're, uh, they're involved in a bureaucratic system that has to engage in these policies to continue to exist, to justify why that department exists. So they engage in budget maximizing. They try and convince everyone around them of the necessity of funding them. Please fund me. I need, I need to be funded. Oh, by the way, this relates to my job and my position. <laughs> so there are a variety of issues in stake, at stake here, and they sometimes get uh, they sometimes get money because sometimes you will see people moralize their own self-interest. That's not unusual in terms of people's behavior where well, they'll say, well, the cause that I happen to have a personal advantage in also is the righteous cause. Hmm, coincidence. You mentioned it, that, there's, that there's group that specifically engage in um, uh, these type, this type of advocacy because well, that is their profession, and and you know they're sort of in this feedback loop where you where you keep arguing for more proposals, <clears throat> and you could say that for a government, it's always uh, easier to follow the road of implementing a new rule because, well, it looks like you're doing something while deregulating something, allowing something will make it look as if you're just letting things go and you give up this type of control. Um, but then the question is, of course, is other than the failure of prohibition as a measure, is that is is the failure of prohibition the only reason it gets lifted, or is there actually also a shift in mentality? Is the only reason that alcohol is now legal in the United States because it was such a disaster and it gave us Al Capone and all these mafia groups, or because those groups that were arguing for it also lost an influence and people changed their minds as per the, 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 the morality of drinking alcohol. There is definitely a shift of no, in norms involved as well. I think it's, you know, without getting too technical, I think it's important to think about the fact that in economics, a lot of things are called externalities, uh, as in things that are outside of a, of a specific transaction. They can be positive or negative. You know, an example of a negative externality is if I throw a party, and there's a lot of noise in the neighborhood that I create. I'm being the proto stereotypical noisy neighbor. Of course, the party is great for me, but the consequences of the party are essentially noise pollution for the people around me. That's negative externality. But in economics, externalities are reciprocal. This is one of the uh, most interesting uh, things that Ronald Coase would say that kind of you know, made me change how I look at these things when I first read it. Uh, Ronald Coase, of course, Nobel Prize recipient, arguably the founder of a, of a field of economics called law and economics said, you know, um, it's not just that I create noise pollution for the people around me, but if people try and shut down my party, then there's a loss on my end because there's the loss of fun that could have been involved in the party. But people don't see it that way. And why don't they see it that way? Because they moralize it because one externality is about a noisy, rude neighbor, and one of them is not. This is why loneliness, even though it doesn't have public health effects, is not described, is not, at least not yet, seen as an externality that we need intervention against, a program to assign everyone a friend. There is no program for that uh, because it's not perceived as the type of pro program that necessitates 
that that that's been moralized in that sense and that therefore necessitates government intervention uh to fix whereas these other problems have been definitely moralized in this sense and they've been moralized to one degree or another over time and to varying success so sometimes people have been really convinced by the arguments but sometimes these arguments were on the wane there were examples of worker riots during the 19th century because employers believe that prohibition at, in the workforce would make them more productive and more efficient, right? They went for a consequentialist style argument where the, it's the consequences of prohibition that matter uh, as a moral statement, but workers were having none of it. So they actually staged like riots, uh, job walkouts. Nowadays, you know, smoking is not permitted indoors and it's perceived as just, again, because of harm arguments, harm to others, but also increasingly harm to self that need to be rectified by somebody other than yourself. So these sorts of arguments have become, uh, these sorts of externalities are important because uh, there's a certain moral grounding to them. There, there's a perceived sense of norms around this that determines what's important and what's not. And, you know, these, these can change. There, there's always contestation of norms. Uh, especially in an open society where you're allowed to disagree with these norms, less so less open societies, as we can see from Russia. But at one time or another, some of these movements will also enact institutions to make sure that one side of the argument has a tougher time. What stands against modern-day prohibitionism, says Emil, is the political backlash against any suggested ban. The problem, however, with a backlash for the mere reason of banning someone's consumption is that you're not arguing from a standpoint of individualism or at least individual responsibility as a principle, but just from the viewpoint of don't take my stuff. The problem with this approach is that it only comes from the consumer, so the common retort will be that the only reason people oppose the ban is that they are the ones who would be affected by it. My name is Christopher Snowden. I work at the Institute of Economic Affairs think tank in London. Uh, I've been there for over a decade now as the head of lifestyle economics and lifestyle economics is um, basically the area of what you might call the nanny state, uh, coercive paternalism. So Chris Snowden is the author of many books, including Velvet Glove, Iron Fist, A History of Anti-Smoking, The Art of Suppression, Pleasure, Panic and Prohibition Since 1800, and Killjoys, A Critique of Paternalism. He also works on the Nanny State Index, a ranking that lists European countries from worst to best every two years, based on their paternalistic policies. In the 2023 index, which you can find at nannystateindex.org, Turkey, Norway and Lithuania top the list as the most restrictive European countries on lifestyle regulation, while Italy, the Czech Republic and Germany are the most permissive countries in Europe. Snowden is not a man who minces his words. You could even consider him the UK's chief anti-paternalist, who does not shy away from the difficult conversations, like here on Channel 4 News. I mean, Christopher Snowden, if you talk to Annie Ashton, whose husband, Luke, took his own life because of gambling um, addiction, she will say that it is an addictive um, thing for some people, and the industry know that, and they, and they thrive on that basis. Well, I would say, frankly, that, you know, hard cases really do make bad law. There's a reason that's a cliche. It's because it's true. You need to uh, look at these things in a, in a, a, a more, you know, from a broader perspective, I'm afraid. You can't just say we're going to have endless incremental kind of ratchet of regulation ultimately leading to prohibition just because some people get into extremely difficult times with problem gambling. But we're still on the premise, so I asked Chris Snowden about the morality of the assumptions that the fun police operates with. Generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that people who are yeah, uh, using these products and engaging in these activities know exactly what they're getting themselves into and are very happy uh, enjoying them and they don't really appreciate a bunch of killjoys trying to um, prevent them from doing it or making it less convenient or making it more expensive. Um, so, look, I will try and make the, the argument, I, I try and make the argument in various different ways. I mean, very often I'm talking about specific policies and one of the things about nanny state policies is that they really, generally speaking, do not work or if they work, they work in the most trivial, negligible form. Um, and they create lots of unintended consequences, lots of unintended consequences, whether it's increasing the size of the black market in products, whether it's putting businesses out of business, um, and whether it's reducing people's consumer welfare. And actually reducing people's consumer welfare is probably the most important part of it, if you believe that you know, we, we want to 
create a, a, a optimally happy society. That is a more difficult argument to make. Although it, again, it depends on the product. You know, if you're talking about chocolate, which most people love, it's quite easy to make the case that we shouldn't be clamping down on chocolate. If you're talking about cigarettes, which most people don't use and a lot of people despise, then just saying, well, people like smoking, therefore they should be allowed to do it, doesn't cut it with everyone. It still cuts it with a lot of people, thank, thank goodness, because you know not everybody has the kind of totalitarian, paternalistic mindset. Um, but a lot of the time I'm talking about policies which can be criticised on their own terms. You can just say, look, this isn't going to work. It hasn't worked anywhere else. It's going to be a waste of money and it's going to create um, various different problems. Or you can talk slightly more philosophically about it and say, well, this isn't going to work, but also it's just immoral to do it in the first place because there isn't really a problem here that um, needs solving. It's none of the government's business. Um, if insofar as these things cause a risk to health, it is only a risk to the individual. The individual knows what the risks are. And again, it's none of the government's business. So, um, yeah, look, it, it depends on, on, on the issue of the day, really. Mm. Um, but, you know, I like to think I have an answer to everything. How often are you asked whether you only uh, support the legality of a lot of these products because you use them yourself? Well, I don't use them all myself. I mean, I don't smoke anymore. I haven't done for, for many years, but I absolutely defend the right for people to continue smoking. And I don't consume a lot of the food and soft drinks that are currently under attack, although I do consume a fair few of them. Um, I do gamble. I do drink a lot of alcohol. So, yeah, I mean, guilty is charged on, on most of it. Um, but, this, you know, it can't come down to that. It can't just come down to people who use a product, want to keep it legal. And what we seem to be does. dealing with is prohibitionism for moral reasons. But instead of being justified by God or an even grander sense of morality, the motivation for bans by the fund police are instead practical. The we only want the best for you argument that erects its own moralistic high horse without needing to justify the existence of unintended consequences. When I asked Snowden whether he was optimistic or pessimistic of genuine prohibition to become a reality again, he had this to say. In terms of sort of post-Neanderthal man, they've been around for a long time. Tobacco has been smoked in America for thousands and thousands of years and, and alcohol, I think, goes back to at least something like 6,000 BC. Um, so it's kind of difficult to imagine life without them, really. Even in Europe, nicotine's been widely used for over 500 years. Um, and the interesting thing is, as soon as you know, cultures do get introduced to these, these products, they take to them you know, very wholeheartedly and don't want to give them up. So I think it's extremely unrealistic to think that we will ever um, ex eliminate uh, alcohol use, certainly very likely nicotine use as well. Certainly we're not going to lose our taste for you know, salt, sh sugar, and fat, which are, you know, there for very good evolutionary reasons. Um, and I doubt we'll ever lose our interest in gambling as well, quite quite possibly. You know, people were, were gambling at the cross, weren't they? You know, in the Bible, this is, you know, these, these things seem to persist. Um, and I think you cause a lot more damage trying to eliminate them than you do um, to just allow them to go on in a sensible, regulated way. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I'm never quite sure how to answer that question because I, I, I do swing from optimism to pessimism quite a bit, and broadly speaking, I am pessimistic. But I think that anything that goes against human nature to this extent is is probably doomed. relationship with alcohol has changed over the years. Actually, you can confidently say each individual's relationship with alcohol changes over their lifetime. I started drinking at the age of 16, which is the legal drinking age in Luxembourg, my home country. It's not an exciting story. Someone put a beer in front of me after a movie night with a couple of secondary school friends. I'm not sure whether I thought it tasted good, but I had four more and I felt that buzz, that sense of confidence. Today, I don't drink that particular beer anymore. I guess I've become a bit of a snob about drinks, and contrary to my time as a 16-year-old, I'm not perpetually broke anymore. Drinking is common in my family, not in excess, but in regularity. 
My father is a lightweight. I've never seen him drink much, just like my mother. But they always share a glass of wine over lunch. She drinks red wine. He drinks white wine. They both pour out the glass at the same time, almost ritualistically. Generations do judge each other about their drinking habits. You don't know how to drink your whole generation. You drink for the wrong reasons. My generation, we drink because it's good. Because it feels better than unbuttoning your collar. Because we deserve it. We drink because it's what men do. What about shaky hands? I see a lot of that too with you boys. No joke. You're kind with your gloomy thoughts and your worries. You're all busy licking some imaginary wound. I suppose Mad Men is not a good reference point for this conversation. If you gave me half of what the characters drink in this show, I'd have a hard time standing up by about 10.30 in the morning. According to the archives at JSTOR, American colonists in 1770 drank an average of three and a half gallons over 13 liters of alcohol a year, about double the modern rate. By 1830, that number had doubled, and colonists over the age of 15 drank more than seven gallons, or 26 liters, of alcohol a year. For reference, that is 520 liters, or 137 gallons, of beer a year, or one and a half liters of beer each day, meaning three pints. We've come a long way from that. Today's drinking habits are far removed from that, and yet we're dealing with frequent moral panics about drinking levels being too high. The fun police are after your drinking habits, not because they care an awful lot for your health, but because they are prohibitionists. In 2018, Lithuania banned all advertising of alcohol and implemented a lot of measures for alcohol control, such as the very odd rule of not being able to sell alcohol on Sundays after 3 in the afternoon. Here's one of the key instigators of this measure, Aurelius Veriga, MD, PhD, President of National Tobacco and Alcohol Control Coalition in Lithuania, on this issue. And for us it's, it's very important because when advertisement disappears, of course the, the effect comes quite soon, and especially when we talk about children. But there is another effect, we can call it side effect or, or another positive effect. If money coming from alcohol industry disappears, there is no motivation for the media to not to post articles about alcohol-related harm. And as someone who has worked as a journalist for now a lengthy period of time, the assumption that Verigas makes here is cynical at best and conspiratorial at worst. If we operated under the assumption that all advertising and media adversely influences the reporting in that news outlet, then which ads would we still allow? Should we ban construction companies from advertising in media because we fear that newspapers will fail to report on construction accidents as a result? Did Volkswagen advertising prevent TV stations from reporting on the emissions scandal? It didn't, but that does not stop activists from making the fallacious argument. In June last year, French President Emmanuel Macron celebrated the win of the Toulouse rugby team in the domestic league final. Macron is frequently seen in the VIP lounges of major sporting events. His appearances at major football games have inspired a lot of memes and social media. And challenged by the players in the changing room, Macron downs a bottle of beer in one go. Innocent clip. The president of a country does a media stunt, celebrates a sports victory with the players, case closed. Not quite. Quote, The president has a responsibility as a role model in terms of setting a healthy example for behavior. End of quote. Bernard Basset from the Association for Addictions in France says. He also added, quote, In this case, he's associating sport, parties, and the consumption of alcohol in a context of virile peer pressure where everyone drinks a bit too much. End of quote. Quote, It's inappropriate, end of quote. William Lowenstein, a doctor and addiction specialist, told the same channel. He also says, You could do it, but not in front of the cameras. Quote, Toxic masculinity in political leadership in one image. End of quote. Tweeted Sandrine Rousseau, an MP for the Green Party. The president of a country, presumably expected to hover above the rest of us, not enjoying the things that all citizens enjoy, a puritanical and purist machine that reads press statements only. Supposedly that is what is expected here. I could nitpick different types of examples with clips, but what I wanted to do is give you a practical example of what slouching prohibitionism looks like in practice. 
My colleague David Clement is Canadian. He's the North American Affairs Manager at Consumer Choice Center and wrote about a new report that says that people shouldn't have more than two drinks per week. A story that made the headlines. Uh, so, I had David explain um, it to us. It's a rather long story, but I'll get I'll get right to the or right to the the nuts and bolts of it. Essentially, Health Canada paid uh, a group called the Canadian Centre for Substance Use and Addiction to reevaluate Canada's alcohol guidelines. So the previous guidelines for let's say men like you and I was no more than two to three drinks per day, speaking the, um, the the health guideline. And that after that point is where you could start to run into some some health risks, but if you stayed within that limit, you're generally, you're, you're doing okay. I think under the old guidelines, 15% of drinkers exceeded those old guidelines, so 15% fall, fell into that problematic category. And so the CCSA goes out and they do their research, um, the research in air quotes, because as we very quickly found out, it was, in the words of people much smarter than me, uh, a compiling of pseudoscientific nonsense um, for an ideological uh, end. And their new conclusion, uh, so overnight, alcohol consumption drastically shifted in terms of how it impacts the human body. And the the CCSA suggested that you should have no more than two alcoholic beverages per week. Uh, So we go from essentially per day to per week. Uh, So a very, very significant shift in what the CCSA is recommending. And that recommendation that is... uh is that would that bound to be law how how is that actually used because if it's just a press statement that's one thing that gets picked up by the news uh, are there more implications to to this recommendation than uh, that initially um, appears so not yet because it is still just a suggestion um but what we're seeing and this is a really uncomfortable um consequence of the pandemic is during the pandemic something called regional health authorities were looked to for guidance in terms of what are the rules on masks where can i go how many people all of those things and those regional health authorities have accepted the ccsa's report at face value without any critical review and so it is not law yet Uh, i don't think there's a scenario where it would become law or enforced in that way. Um, But it is slowly becoming the official recommendation of the government. The reason that that's an issue is because it's so divorced from the reality of alcohol consumption and what we actually know about when risks start for consumers. A fundamentally strange report, says David, that made the headlines of many news outlets. Something didn't seem right. How did alcohol's impact on the human body change that drastically from two to three drinks per day to no more than two drinks per week. What has fundamentally changed in that relationship between humans and alcohol in that time? And the answer is obviously nothing has changed. Uh, What changed is how they were interpreting the data and what they wanted to conveniently ignore to try and get to the conclusion Um, that there is no safe uh, level of alcohol consumption, which is their words, uh, and that every drink increases risk, which is, again, those their words. uh, Both statements uh, are not true. And there's the crux of the issue, meaning the authors of the report. Because for all it's worth, we're expecting the authors of scientific reports to be independent researchers, people removed from all biases towards the issues they research on. And that's not what happened. Essentially, what I did after I saw the report is I started to dig in, okay, who wrote this? And there are a handful of of very prominent anti-alcohol researchers uh, who were the names associated with the CCSA's report. And I started to look into who these individuals are and what their affiliations are. And it turns out that the three people who published the CCSA report are members of an organization called Movendi. 
and Movendi is a 200 year old anti-alcohol temperance group. Um, they're a group who lobbied for prohibition back in the day and their position is that the world would be better off if nobody ever had any alcohol or any intoxicating drugs for that matter uh, ever again. So these people are hardcore teetotalers. Uh, and the reason why that matters beyond the gerrymandering of the numbers is imagine if Health Canada said we want a report on what the healthy level of meat consumption is. And they paid an organization and the people who represent that organization were hardcore vegans and card-carrying members of the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. PETA. That's the equivalency in terms of how this report was created and who wrote it. Uh, and I say that because they obviously came to a pre-drawn conclusion that any amount of alcohol is bad and it needs to be avoided at all costs, despite the fact that we have a long, long history of research showing that that isn't necessarily the case. And so we've essentially outsourced public health or public health policy to these activists um, whose affiliations are well known uh, and whom at every turn want to limit your ability to access alcohol, whether that be increasing the drinking age limit, limiting stores and what they can sell, um, creating <laughs> gerrymandered reports with data that ignores any of the health benefits. And so you have this neo-prohibitionist group or neo-temperance group, Movendi, driving the bus on public policy decisions uh, in a way in which nobody really asked for, other than Health Canada. I, there are no Canadians um, asking for this. We didn't ask for our, our, uh, our tax dollars to be spent on this ideological report on alcohol. Nobody asked for it. Um, and so here we are. We have um, Health Canada potentially adopting these guidelines, even though the viewpoints are of, of the researchers and the authors are so known to the public um, that it, it, it's problematic from the point of view that you, you have to review this critically because, again, on the PETA and meat example, if it came out that Health Canada was considering meat guidelines based on the research of PETA scholars, I think everyone would collectively roll their eyes and cast the report aside and say, okay, maybe we get some more serious people on this um, who don't have a pre-drawn conclusion on what the ideal situation looks like. Um, and when I say pre-drawn conclusion, as members of Movendi, um, they have to take an oath, rather cult-like oath, to live a life abstaining from alcohol and other intoxicating drugs. Um, so these, these people are very serious and very hardcore in their viewpoint that uh, not only do they not consume these products, you shouldn't either. And what is interesting about Movendi is that, well, you say it's an organization that is... Uh has been you know established a long time ago they weren't always called movendi they weren't no they weren't they used to be the international order of good templars um and they <laughs> rebranded themselves in 2020 i think because that name sounds like it's pulled directly out of a dan brown novel um it feels like it's from the da vinci code when i when I hear that, I think, ooh, there's some nefarious things going on in Rome um, and, and whatnot. And so, yeah, they rebranded to Movendi, I think, to have a, a more uh, appealing name. But they're the same organization they've been for 200 years. And another thing to just focus just a little longer on, on Movendi, how is, – is there a – um, a big donor, uh, a foundation that 
says like, well, we really despise the uh, the, the nefarious effects of alcohol, and we will donate, uh, we will get charitable donations uh, from from all people all around the world to to fund that operation. Is that how it works? No, um, it's funny. It's a little different um, and and a lot more hypocritical. Uh, so Movendi, the group that uh, is waging war on the sin of alcohol. Uh, it funds its neo-temperance lobby by running a lottery in Sweden. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's um, they they run a, a lottery. Yes. They this is there's a gambling operation. They they funded through a gambling operation in in Sweden. Yes, um, the the Puritans are not pure. Um, they fund themselves by running a lottery, and there's nothing wrong with running a lottery. Um, I don't think there's anything immoral um, about gambling. You should do so responsibly and know your limit and, and play within it. Um, but there is something just incredibly irritating and hypocritical to be launching a war on one sin uh, or one vice um, off of the revenues generated from another. And it's one step further than that that makes it even more irritating because we're not just talking about any old lottery we're actually talking about a lottery in sweden that's been sued by sweden's consumer agency for using misleading marketing tactics for defrauding consumers for appealing to minors so all of the things that movendi and their researchers accuse the alcohol uh, industry of doing, um, they have been caught doing with their lottery um, in Sweden. And so immediately, like right off the bat, when you see it, it just stinks. It stinks because you it, it feels so incredibly hypocritical and nefarious. And it really starts to make you question why we take these people seriously at all anymore. I reached out to Movendi to get their side of the story but I didn't receive a response. Movendi International runs a podcast of its own. It's called Alcohol Issues. You can find it on Spotify. And it's run by Mike Dunbier, the Director of Strategy and Advocacy at Movendi. They interviewed Dr. Timothy Naimi, one of the authors of the report. I'm really happy that uh, you have taken the time to talk with me today. Uh, so warm welcome to you. Oh, Mike, well, thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure. The episode is full of softballs really of Dunbier congratulating Naimi for his good work. The fact that he himself and his fellow researchers have conflicts of interest is never mentioned. The conclusion with Movendi, ultimately, as is for other prohibitionists, is that their goal is to regulate all alcohol away. We'll let the folks at Movendi end the episode. So with this, uh, Tim, you have given us, uh, I, as I have summarized now, I think a really nice agenda. So thank you so much, Tim. Um, for this report and for this podcast conversation. Oh, it was a lot of fun, and hopefully I haven't taken a complicated uh, problem and made it worse. Fun Police is a Consumer Choice Center original podcast. Today's episode was written and researched by me, Bill Wirtz, contributing research by Elizabeth Hicks and Emil Panjau, editing by Jalo Salsky and myself. The books of Chris Ryman and Christopher Snowden are available on Amazon, paper, Temperance Revived, The Core Tenants and Tactics of Neo-Prohibitionism by Emil Panjau and myself is available on consumerchoicecenter.org, where you can also find all the other things we're doing in this Fund Police campaign. Link in the description. Thank you for those who support our work with a donation, consumerchoicecenter.org slash donate. Next episode will be out next week on Wednesday and will be hosted by Jarosowski. Until then, stay clear of the Fund Police. <laughs>